Okay, so I'd like to welcome everyone to another uh, edition of Q of I. This is the first um, quantum fluids and isolation seminar for 2021. I'm very happy to introduce um, Dr. Dominic Els. So uh, Dominic got his bachelor's degree in physics from the University of Sydney in 2011 and then his master's degree um, in physics from the University of Sydney in 2012. And then he got his PhD in physics from the University of California, Santa Barbara in 2018, after which he went on to a more postdoctoral, become a more postdoctoral fellow at Massachusetts Institute of Technology uh, beginning in 2018 where he is today. And today he'll be talking about illuminating the physics of strange metals through general constraints. So please help me in welcoming either by unmuting yourselves and clapping or virtually Dr. Dominic Els. Uh, all right, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Joshua, for inviting me for organizing this seminar, which is always a useless, useful service in, in this era. Um, right, so I'm going to be talking about the uh, strange metals, uh, which is work which I did with my collaborators, uh, Ryan Fongren, uh, on the first paper, and then on, on both papers, uh, Cento at MIT. Um, and I should mention, please feel free to uh, interrupt me with questions. Uh, my talk isn't that long. It's actually only uh, about 45 minutes without interruption. So there'll be plenty of time to uh, discuss uh, during the talk or, or afterwards. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be talking about metals. And so the question is, how should we understand the low energy physics of a metal? And so, of course, there's this famous Fermi liquid theory, which, which postulates that you have this Fermi surface in momentum space and then the low energy excitations of these long lived quasi particle excitations. And Fermi liquid theory is a very successful theory in the sense that it describes uh, correctly many materials, but uh, not all materials. There are uh, a lot of materials also that are not captured by Fermi liquid theory. And then the question for theorists is to determine what the, the correct description of such non Fermi liquid metals uh, would be. So that's a question I would like to address in this talk. Uh, and uh, for concreteness, we can think about a particular kind of non-Fermi liquid, which is just a strange metal regime that's uh, seen in, in, for example, in doped corporate materials. So it's like YBCO, for example. Of course, as everyone knows, YBCO is a famous material as, as of a cuprate generally because it has high temperature superconductivity. Um, but there's also a lot of other interesting stuff going on in the phase diagram of these materials. So here is a typical phase diagram for a cuprate, uh, doping versus temperature. You have a superconducting dome here, which is this uh, high temperature superconductor. Um, but there's also this interesting regime, the strange metal, which appears above the superconductor. And uh, if you suppress the superconductivity by applying a magnetic field, for example, strange metal seems to go all the way down to a zero temperature. So it's some zero temperature state of matter, but it's metallic, uh, and that we need to try to understand. And it, well, at the moment, it's not really clear what, what is going on there. And, and, and it's not for lack of trying. You know, many people have been interested in this, but it seems a very difficult problem. Um, certainly, it's not described by Fermi liquid theory. I mean, there are different, there are many signatures you can look at experimentally to prove it's not described by Fermi liquid theory. I'll just mention one, which is that Fermi liquid theory would predict a resistivity with scaling proportional to the temperature squared. But in a strange metal, it has very clearly a, a resistivity that's linear in, in T. That's totally different. And generally, people would, would expect that oh, Fermi liquid theory is characterized by having these well defined quasi particles, but strange metals would not have any well defined quasi particles. We just have some quantum soup of excitations um, that we need to somehow work out how to describe. So, as I said, it's very difficult to, to work out what is the correct uh, low energy description of a strange metal. Uh, uh, and I won't fully answer that question in this talk. Um, but I want to, what I want to show you is that you can actually make uh, at least some progress in understanding what must be going on in the strange metal, even in the absence of a uh, complete theory of a strange metal. And so here's what our strategy is going to be. So there are a lot of experimental observations that people have done on strange metals. Um, we're going to condense those experimental observations into a, a small set of minimal assumptions, which we gave a fancy name. We call them our central dogmas. Uh, there's some historical uh, precedent for that terminology, but in any case, that's that's what we would call them, central dogmas. So basically, the point of the central dogmas is to take all these plethora of experimental observations and reduce them into a small set of, of uh, principles that we can use as our starting point to do theory. Um, so in this talk, I will uh, this talk will be largely theoretical, so I won't talk very much about uh, what the experimental observations are and how, how they can motivate these 
uh, central dogmas. I, I will just state what the central dogmas are, and that will be the starting point of, of the talk. But if you are, are interested in uh, more about uh, the question of how you motivate these assumptions from experiments, uh, I will refer you to uh, the talk that my collaborator Central gave uh, yesterday for the Center for Mathematical Sciences uh, at Harvard. Um, and that, that talk is uh, available, uh, the recording is on YouTube, so you can check that out. Okay, so these experimental questions, I will refer you to, 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 his, to this talk, um, but let me just state now what the assumptions are and, and then we'll, we'll go from there. So here are the assumptions that we're going to make, uh, and there's three of them, and this is what we call our central dogmas. Firstly, we assume that uh, strange metals uh, can be described by a clean ladder system without impurities. Now, certainly that's a non-trivial assumption. I mean, the, the real, in real life materials always have some impurities. Um, uh, I mean, I mean, especially the, the scuprates, the, the doped materials, so they, they, they really have to have impurities. But uh, what we're going to assume is that the, the physics, essential physics of a strange metal does not depend on those impurities. Uh, that you could have a strange metal physics occurring in a clean ladder system if hypothetically you could realize such a system. And there is some experimental basis for saying that, uh, well, again, I will refer you to the Central's talk, but in any case, this is a, a good starting point. Uh, let's see if we can get the strange metal physics um, just in a clean ladder system without impurities. So that's assumption number one. Uh, the second assumption uh, is that if the system is compressible, let me defer uh, explaining what I mean by that to the next slide. Um, and then the third assumption is uh, this conductivity scaling. So what we assume, and this again comes from what people see in experiment, is that uh, if you plot the conductivity as a function of frequency and as a function of temperature, um, that it, it has this scaling collapse form, where there's a scaling function sigma, which is a function of one variable, and you can write the conductivity, which is a function of frequency and temperature, two variables in terms of this function of a single variable uh, in this form. And then furthermore, we assume that the scaling function is such that uh, evaluated at zero argument, that's uh, some finite number. So you can, for example, set a make equal zero in this equation, and you find that sigma, the DC conductivity is, is inversely proportional to temperature. So that's the T linear resistivity that I uh, already mentioned before. Um, but so this assumption is incorporating the T linear resistivity, but it's a stronger assumption because we're assuming that also this uh, scaling is a function of frequency. Um, but that does seem to be what uh, the experiments show. Um, Okay, so uh, I told you I was gonna say what I mean by compressible, so let me uh, get to that. So compressible is expressed in terms of uh, this number called the filling, which is the uh, average number of electrons per translation unit cell. And then the definition of compressible uh, is that this number new, the filling, is continuously tunable uh, without qualitatively changing the physics. Um, so uh, an example of something that's not compressible would be uh, an insulator. Generally, an insulator can only occur at, at integer filling. Um, so at nucleus one, you can have an insulator. At nucleus 1.01, you can't have an insulator anymore. It would be metallic at that point. So uh, an insulator is not a compressible state of matter. But generally, we would expect that metals would be compressible because metals are, are what occur when you have a you know, finite density of holes. That's what allows the electrons to hop between atoms and, and conduct electricity. So for metals, you sort of expect that you can have it for any uh, real value of a filling, you could have the same metallic behavior. So there's no reason why the, the, this number new couldn't be uh, continuously tunable. So that's what we assume. Um, and certainly this is the case for fermi liquid metals. Uh, that are, I mean, if you just look at it, you'll see that fermi liquids are compressible. Um, for strange metals, it's a little bit more non-trivial. I mean, there is experiments to, to suggest that it's still compressible. For example, you can vary the pressure and you'll see that the filling of the switch of strange metal occurs uh, seems to change continuously. So that would mean that it's compressible. Uh, so those are the assumptions we're going to make. Uh, and then, okay, good. so let's see what we can do with those assumptions. Uh, and I should mention that uh, the first two of these assumptions uh, are actually satisfied also in, um, uh, Fermi liquids. So uh, the first two assumptions are not uh, representing any, any exotic physics. Uh, it's just the same thing that happens in Fermi liquids. Uh, so to the extent that we derive consequences that only depend on the first two assumptions, then uh, those consequences must be also true for Fermi liquid theory. Um, the third assumption is definitely not satisfied by Fermi liquid theory, and that's, that's going to be the difference between strange metals 
and flaming liquids for the point of view of its analysis. So let's talk about transport and strange metal because this, this assumption is in terms of conductivity. So we need to understand uh, how, do, how is conductivity gonna work in a strange metal. And so uh, at this point, it's helpful to induce the idea of the uh, IR effective theory that's a renormalization group fixed point. So you have a physics of your system, which is ultimately described by some microscopic Hamiltonian, but then there's some coarse graining transformation, renormalization group transformation um, that induces some flow in the space of Hamiltonians. Uh, and then eventually you expect that the system will flow to a, a IR fixed point uh, effective field theory and that effective field theory will describe the, uh, the low energy and long wavelength physics of, of the system. So let's come back to this conductivity scaling assumption. How should we interpret that? We should interpret this uh, form of the conductivity as being the conductivity of the IR fixed point theory. The reason being that the IR fixed point theory, I mean, by definition, has some scale invariance, and then this scaling collapse is actually just a manifestation of that scale invariance. And so what we argue in the paper is that um, this is the only possible interpretation of this equation. There's, there's really no other tenable interpretation of this equation. It, it must be that uh, this formula is telling you about the conductivity of the IR fixed point theory. And so you should, con you should contrast this behavior with what happens in Fermi liquid theory. Uh, okay, so, so first I should say that uh, if this, this is the conductivity of the IR fixed point theory, now you can set a make equal to zero. Uh, and then um, by assumption, sigma of zero is finite. So uh, you conclude that the DC conductivity of the IR fixed point theory is a finite, not infinite uh, for non-zero temperature. Uh, and you should con contrast this with the behavior of Fermi liquid theory. In Fermi liquid theory, uh, if you plot the conductivity as a function of frequency, uh, it's actually just a delta function of frequency. Um, and um, and uh, it's also temperature independent. Um, so that, that's the conductivity of the Fermi liquid fixed point theory, uh, the RG fixed point theory. Of course, if you have uh, scattering from umklap or something, that tends to broaden out the uh, delta function. Um, and it would give you a finite DC conductivity, but that's the umklap in Fermi liquid theory is an irrelevant perturbation in the RG sense. So if you actually just look at the IR fixed point theory on its own, uh, it, it, it's, just, it's just this delta function. Um, so the DC conductivity is infinite. And so that's the difference between Fermi liquid theory, which has DC conductivity infinite, uh, and the strange metal, which has finite DC conductivity. And this is a mystery we have to try to explain. How can the strange metal have finite DC conductivity in the fixed point theory? And that's what we call intrinsic resistivity because the resistivity is non-zero uh, in the fixed, fixed point theory. So it's actually uh, rather surprising that you could have a, a theory that has this intrinsic resistivity. And the reason is because of momentum conservation. Um, so let's consider a, a theory where it has a conserved momentum. And uh, here I'm gonna assume that it's a momentum corresponding to a continuous translation symmetry. Of course, microscopically, you only have lattice translation symmetry, but what we know about, for example, Fermi liquid theory is that um, lattice translation symmetry gets enhanced to a continuous translation symmetry uh, in the IR. You have an emergent continuous translation symmetry because of the fact that umklap is irre irre irrelevant. Now you may question whether this is also true for the strange metal, but uh, it's plausible that it's true. I'll come back to that point later, but let's assume for the moment that you have a continuous translation symmetry uh, in, in whatever metallic system you're considering. And therefore you have conserved momentum. Now let's imagine that we apply an electric field uh, for some time to the system, and then we uh, switch it off again and then see what happens. Um, so uh, momentum is a conserved quantity, except not when you apply an electric field. When you apply an electric field, of course, it's going to impart a momentum to the system. So it's momentum will change. So you, while you're applying the electric field, the momentum of the system, uh, system picks up some momentum. Once you remove the electric field, the momentum is a conserved quantity again. So you, once you remove the electric field, you just have this, uh, whatever momentum you've picked up, it will just stay in the system forever. And so what you would generally expect, if you think about what has happened with your electrical current, uh, initially before you apply the electric field, there was no electrical current. Um, but now you apply an electric field, the current starts to flow. But let's think about what happens at late times. Because the system has picked up some momentum, uh, eventually what you expect will happen is that the system will reach a new thermal equilibrium state. But that new thermal equilibrium state will be characterized by uh, having a non-zero value of the momentum. 
because you've picked up this momentum and then it's a conserved quantity. So you can't, you can't eliminate it. You just keep it. And the thermal equilibrium states in represents of momentum conservation are labeled by the value of momentum. So you, you will get to some thermal equilibrium state um, and that has some non-zero value of momentum uh, as opposed to the original one you started with which had a zero momentum. And then what you would generally expect is that if a system is carrying momentum that it would also carry current. And so you would, the current would relax to some steady state described by a thermal equilibrium, but the current would be non-zero in that state. Um, so, and so another point is that that means that the current is flowing forever without dissipation. If you have current flowing forever without dissipation, it means that the resistivity of the system is zero over DC conductivity is, is infinite. Uh, if you think in terms of the uh, AC conductivity, if conductivity as a function of frequency would have a, a delta function in it, you know, plus some, some non simple pieces, but at least it has to have this delta function. So this is what we'd call a momentum bottleneck. And it's sort of suggesting that generically when you have uh, conserved momentum that you would also have uh, infinite DC conductivity because the conserved conservation momentum is preventing the current from relaxing. But somehow we need to get around this because the strange metal we said was, was not gonna have infinite DC conductivity. Uh, so how do we how do we do that? Uh, uh, so uh, Dominic, there's one question in the chat. Um, Conrad Shom said you must have broken translational invariance. Uh, well, that's a statement, not a question. Um, uh, do you, perhaps, is, perhaps I, I can do a commentary on this. When you start out strictly in a continuum, the thing you have will not fly. So somehow you have to break translations, right? And then the story that you have can fly again. But deep inside, it will not happen in our continuous continuum. So you can see that. Well, you're saying that you want the strange metal to not have continuous translations? No, no, the electrical construction you were doing somehow requires translational symmetry breaking, unclops scattering in a pure homogeneous continuum. It will never happen, I bet. Does it matter, right? You, you basically say you flow to a fixed point where unclop is irrelevant, you no longer see it, right? And then you want to have your uh, 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 scaling response, right? And then it's hard work without translational symmetry break, and there you have a story. That is the logic of all of this. It's okay, you know? Uh, I'll continue. Well, uh, I'm not sure if I understood what you're saying. I mean, uh, it's natural to think that- I just continue for two, two minutes, and then I may interfere again and say, here, you have implicitly assumed breaking of translations. It's a bit subtle. Well, here, so this argument, I'm explicitly not- No, this is about that... homogeneous continuum. Yes, where you have uh, an homogeneous uh, spatial uh, manifold, momentum conserved, and you have to have a drooping at finite density. And you say, no, I don't want to do this. Uh, what I'm trying to say is how can you avoid having this through peak? Maybe, maybe that will, maybe the next slide will make it clear what I'm saying. Yeah, um, no, no, I understand all of this. I'm trying to explain to you what Kuma Tron was trying to explain to you. And it's more subtle than you're saying. This is all primitive, of course, to understand it. We are not complete idiots. Uh, just continue, you know, it's just a commentary. Uh, okay, so the, yeah, the question I'm trying to address is how do you remove this, this, this through the peak, that's the question. Uh, and so many people would say translation symmetry breaking, but I'm I'm basically trying to argue against that. But anyway, you'll see what my arguments are. Um, so, okay, how do you eliminate this infinite DC conductivity? Uh, one of them is by disorder. Um, I mean, this contradicts the central dogmas that I, that I stated that I, I, I tried to assume, I wanted to assume that the disorder is not important uh, for, for, for this physics. So. I mean, of course, you can argue about whether that's a valid assumption or not. It, it, it's a starting point for my talk. Um, and as I mentioned there, you can try to argue it experimentally, but I, I won't get into that. Um, so, okay, so but, okay, if we're gonna throw out disorder, which is what I always do this in this talk, how, what else could you do? You could imagine having an clap, um, by which I just mean that the um, momentum conservation is broken by the lattice. Uh, so you, instead of having continuous translation symmetry, you just have a discrete translation symmetry. Uh, and if that's really, uh, if UNCLAP is really effective, then uh, indeed you wouldn't have the, uh, this momentum bottleneck issue that I mentioned. But the problem is that um, what I want to claim is that UNCLAP is always going to be an irrelevant perturbation to the IR fixed point theory. And so that's a well-known fact about Fermi liquid theory. It's maybe, 
a more non-trivial claim to say that it's also going to be uh, irrelevant in the strange metal. But uh, I mean, you'll see later on what, what my arguments, why, why that is, is the case are. At least at the moment, I'm just asserting it that uh, UNCLAP will always be irrelevant perturbation, even for a strange metal. Okay, so that's that's not that's not the solution either. And one of them, a, a different possibility would say yes. Okay, we still have conservation momentum, but maybe electric field doesn't actually impart any momentum to the system. Um, uh, so you apply an electric field, and it just doesn't pick up any momentum, and therefore there's no current uh, flowing. Um, but actually, this is uh, inconsistent with. Um, uh, this assumption I made about compressibility. Compressibility, or another way to say it is that compressibility means you have non-zero charge density. Uh, if you have non-zero charge density, uh, uh, electric field is always going to impart momentum to the system. So, so that's also not a viable solution. Uh, so there's only one possibility left, and that's that's the one I want to discuss now, which is that yes, momentum is conserved, but the weight of the delta function is suppressed by quantum criticality. And I so, just interrupt on your point of UNCLAP. Um, right, so in a Fermi liquid, uh, it's true that at least on the level at zero temperature, it, it turns into a perfect conductor. But when you go to a finite temperature, you get a T square uh, insistivity because UNCLOP is an irrelevant perturbation. So on shell, it disappears at zero temperature and zero frequency. But at finite temperature, it raises its head again as a mean of an irrelevant perturbation. So I don't quite get the statement that. UMCLAP cannot do it. Well, UMCLAP can give you a... Uh, it gives you T-squared resistivity, my dear. Yeah, of course. Uh, it gives you T-squared resistivity. Of course, a strange metal doesn't have T-squared resistivity. It has... So what? So what? That doesn't tell you anything. It's not a fermi liquid, yes, but you're making statements about non fermi liquids. non fermi liquids can also know about UMCLAP. Yes, yeah, so the question, like the question is whether so the question whether more. is whether UMCLAP is an irrelevant perturbation or not. So yeah, uh, it, it may well it is an irrelevant perturbation when in the absence of uh, disorder on a perfectly periodic lattice at zero temperature, your conductivity becomes infinite. That's the meaning of uh, UMCLAP is irrelevant for the current operator. Yes, I agree with that statement. At finite temperatures, of course, you have a finite resistivity. Not only in the thermal liquid, on in anything that talks to momentum, well, this is now completely yeah. generic. Maybe, maybe it's a it's a somewhat subtle point. Maybe I should I should try to uh, explain. Okay. No, no, you don't. You don't get it. Sorry, this is just blundering. Uh, excuse me, it's, it's bullshit. Continue. Jan, what you are saying is not true. Okay. Excuse what me, Chandra. In a, uh, pure, in a pure metal, what he called D, due to umklau becomes temperature dependent. You have, plus a, true, you have a true weight, Chandra, and a root weight. Allow me to and, finish. Yeah, yeah. Hey. Okay. Chandra, you're drunk. You're drunk, sorry about it. I, I, I stop arguing because you're all sort of, you know, and don't know where you are. This is basic, simple Drut theory. There's no magic here, come on. I think, I think you have to rethink basic Drut theory. What he's talking about is completely correct. The coefficient D, I know, but you're not there yet, Chandra. I'll go to zero. So to Chandra, be honest, I, I'm not sure that either I of you are really uh, getting up what I'm saying. So perhaps but you're uh, just confused. So I, I agree that B um, right, is uh, very hard to get to zero. Absolutely. And that is the story. And I'm listening. That's interesting, Chandra. I'm saying something else. So maybe we can discuss this at the end or offline. I just so, continue. Uh, it's all in yeah, yeah. So, so Dominic, why don't you continue? Yeah, so let me just say one thing. That, I mean, I want, I want to make it very clear what I'm saying. I'm saying that uh, if you want the DC, in Fermi liquid theory, the DC conductivity of the fixed point theory uh, is infinite, even at non-zero temperature. Right. Now, of course, in real life, you don't have a fixed point theory. You have fixed point theory plus irrelevant perturbations. That's why you get T squared resistivity, et cetera. But if you literally just have the if Hamiltonian of a fixed point theory, the resistivity is infinite, even at non-zero temperature. There are completely that, and that is what I'm saying yeah. uh, is not the case for the strange metal based on this conductivity scaling. So that's the difference. No, not quite. Not quite because in a strange metal, it could be right that at finer temperature, the umklop is switching on, causing that uh, uh, linear and T behavior. That can happen. You are away from the fixed point when you say, right, uh, I look at the frequency and temperature dependent of conductivity. You're not on the fixed point. 
right? So what you're addressing is okay, right? There, so there, 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 there's the issue whether the root weight in a normal uh, context can go to zero. That's, that's what you're arguing about. And that's so I, I want to emphasize that the, weight, the conductivity is a function of, of two things. It's a function of temperature and it's a function of a coupling constants uh, in your theory. So what I'm saying is a, a, a hypothetical case. I mean, it's not physically what happens, but consider a hypothetical case where you have non-zero temperature, but the coupling constants are exactly on the fixed point theory. So, I mean, that's not physical, but it's it's a theoretically a, an interesting case to consider. And that's the case where I'm saying that thermal liquid theory has infinite resistivity, yeah. infinite and conductivity, and strange metals does not. Uh, that, that's the important against, distinction I'm making here. I'm just protesting against imprecise formulation. The thing you want, the case you want to make is interesting. I'm not protesting against that at all. Yes, well, I mean, I agree. We should formulate things precisely. I hope that I hope that what I said was was clearer and the correct precise statement. Um, okay, so so the, the mechanism I want to argue for, and I want to argue at least consistent with assumptions that I've made, the central dogmas. It's the only possible mechanism is this quantum criticality mechanism. So I will now explain how that works. So, so I had this picture of a momentum bottleneck, as I mentioned, um, which is, uh, you know, you have this momentum, you're picking up this momentum, and then therefore you also have current. But suppose you pick up momentum, um, but you don't pick up current, at least not at late times. So uh, the, electric field, uh, the electric field can induce some, some current, but uh, the current will exit to zero at late times when you go to thermal equilibrium, even though the momentum is still non-zero. That's, that's the mechanism I, I want to consider. In other words, you need to have a thermal equilibrium state of a system that has non-zero momentum, but zero current. That's what I want to claim is, 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 is going to happen. So how does this happen and why is it related to quantum criticality? Let me, let me try to explain that now. Uh, so we need to talk about uh, thermal equilibrium states in the presence of momentum conservation. Um, so uh, the thermal equilibrium states uh, in presence of momentum conservation, you should label them by the momentum of the system, or alternatively, you can label by the thermodynamically conjugate uh, variable. For you know, just as like uh, you can label thermal equilibrium states by particle number or by chemical potential, it's a similar thing going on here. So in, here, I'm going to imagine that you label the thermal equilibrium states by the thermodynamically conjugate variable to momentum, which uh, I write v, and it has an interpretation as, as the drift velocity of the system. Um, okay, so this ensemble is sort of similar to like the grand canonical ensemble where you, you write it in terms of chemical potential, but with uh, momentum instead of particle number as being the conserved quantity. And then what one can show by elementary arguments, I, I won't get into this, is that the current density is equal to the charge density times the drift velocity. Of course, it seems like a very obvious statement when you use these words, but you have to make sure you're using the correct precise definitions of all these quantities. Um, but in any case, that you, you end up finding this result. And so Q here is a charge density of a system, which you can argue must be non-zero because of the compressibility condition that we've assumed. So therefore the current density, uh, so the thermal equilibrium state that I wanted to find was one with uh, zero current, um, but non-zero momentum. Um, because of this proportionality um, and the charge density is non-zero, a uh, zero current means that the velocity is also zero. On the other hand, uh, think about the expectation value for momentum uh, in this thermal equilibrium state. Expectation value will be uh, some susceptibility coefficient times the velocity. And this equation is really just defining what I mean by chi pp. Uh, but it's a kind of thermodynamic susceptibility, like for example, uh, you know, uh, charge susceptibility, which is the relation between uh, charge and chemical potential. So it's a similar thing here. It's some kind of thermodynamic susceptibility is what this chi pp is. But I told you that I want v equals zero, but I want p non-zero. So how does that make sense? The only way that can make sense is if chi pp is infinite. So this is the conclusion I have, that it's the only way to get this behavior that we see in the strange metal is to have this uh, diverging uh, susceptibility chi pp. So that's a conclusion I made, which is a, actually a very strong conclusion about the strange metal. So how should we interpret this equation of this divergence? So this strange metal at zero temperature is where I'm saying that it would have this uh, uh, diverging susceptibility. Now we know that susceptibilities in thermodynamics are very closely related to fluctuations. Um, so, so having this uh, susceptibility mean infinite is basically equivalent to saying we have critical fluctuations 
Uh, critical fluctuations means, for example, that you know correlations decays at power of distance. And specifically, it's critical fluctuations of an order parameter that has specific symmetry properties. It, it's basically because of the symmetry properties of this P. So the order parameter should be odd on the time reversal symmetry, odd under inversion symmetry, should be at zero crystal momentum, and should transform as a vector under rotation symmetry. So that's the conclusion we've made about the strange just based on these general arguments, that we have these critical fluctuations of an order parameter with this uh, particular symmetry. So, uh, okay, so the strange matter would be characterized by this quantum criticality um, with its critical fluctuations. So if I just said that the strange metal has quantum criticality, that maybe wouldn't be too shocking. I mean, a lot of people have made similar statements in the past, but we are saying something a bit stronger than that, actually, which is uh, we have to, it's a sp specific kind of quantum criticality, which is characterized by these fluctuations of this order parameter with this particular symmetry. And this is something we've learned just on, on completely general grounds. Now, this is probably related to the physics that's going on in, in the pseudogap phase. So the pseudogap is, uh, I forgot to label my axes here, but this, this axis on the horizontal is the doping. Um, so if you, uh, the doping is less than the critical value, uh, you're in the undergrowth regime, and people normally call that the pseudogap uh, phase. Uh, and so uh, the fact that you have this critical fluctuations of this uh, order parameter with symmetries uh, suggests that probably once you go into the pseudogap phase, that, that this order parameter would actually acquire an expectation value. And so that means that if this order parameter is acquiring an expectation value, then you're, spontane you're spontaneously breaking uh, these symmetries. You're spontaneously breaking time reversal and inversion symmetry. Um, you're not spontaneously breaking a translation symmetry because the, the order parameter is at zero crystal momentum. Uh, and you're uh, spontaneously breaking rotation symmetry. So we have this particular spontaneous symmetry breaking structure in the pseudogap phase that is, is, is going to be closely linked to this quantum criticality, which is uh, the explanation for the conductivity properties of the strange metal. And so I should, and, and so there is experimental evidence that uh, used for some of these symmetries that they are spontaneously broken in the pseudogap phase. Um, uh, so that's nice that we, uh, I mean, we had this very general theoretical arguments, but you know, we're, we're actually making contact with stuff that people see experimentally. Um, uh, so, so yeah, that, I mean, that's really nice to see. And of course, I have to mention that uh, Chandra Varma has uh, proposed this picture of spontaneous symmetry breaking in the pseudogap phase based on these uh, loop currents. So within the unit cell, we have this microscopic currents flowing um, yeah, in, in loops. Uh, I think he proposed this maybe even before the experiments, and then the experiments could be viewed as, a, I guess, a, some kind of confirmation of that. Um, at least, uh, I mean, so we do at least from our point of view, we don't have a very microscopic point of view on the physics. We're just saying that we have some effective field theory and, and, it, and it seems to have this uh, order parameter uh, that has particular symmetries. So in that sense, we're a bit agnostic as to whether this is actually the um, correct microscopic description of the order, because all we know is essentially what symmetries it should break. And that certainly this would be a candidate for, for that uh, ordering that would have the right symmetries. Um, and it's also very interesting that we were able to get to this, this symmetry breaking from these general theoretical grounds, which I think was very different from what Chandra Varma had, had in mind when, when he was writing these papers. I will take uh, criticism, just a moment to clarify quickly what I meant with eventually you break translational symmetry breaking. So let me do it as a conjecture. I conjecture that the condition that chi pp goes to infinite can only be realized in a system that uh, descends from a lattice. I could point the case is uh, Varma's uh, genre's uh, loop currents, right? That you can only construct on a lattice. That's not something that can exist in the continuum. It's conjecture, right? You can think hard and, and just try to disprove it, that these things also can happen in the uh, continuum. That, that's really my point. Okay, you can make that conjecture. I yeah. would be surprised if that conjecture was true. Uh, um, just think very hard about a, a situation in a physical field theory that departs from the uh, uh, homogeneous spatial manifold that has, the, uh, has this emergent property at a fixed point of chi pp going to infinite. And we can bet about it. You know, I don't have a theory, but I bet that you won't find any example. I mean, the theories that I'm talking about have an emergent continuous translation. So from that point of view, it would be a bit weird if they needed you know, to have a lattice. I mean, the order parameter is these or that properties, right, to have it. I have to make these order parameters, and that's actually a UV sensitive, like uh, genre's uh, uh, loop currents. 
Yeah, I mean, it's like, okay, it's actually true for these loop currents. These loop currents kind of look like they have some some lattice stuff going on, but no, it, it's I don't know. If, a lattice. Without lattice, it cannot exist. John will agree with that. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's not arguing, it's, it's a bit of a challenge. Uh, I conjecture, right, uh, that, that you need the lattice eventually in order to uh, find the right conditions uh, for your Kuiper P to infinite. That's it. I mean, the type of being infinite is just what you expect if if you have a phase transition into a spontaneous symmetry breaking no, uh, phase. And I don't see why you would need a lattice to spontaneously break inversion symmetry and all these symmetries that are being involved. Yeah, I mean, just, just think about it. So write down a continuum on the field theory uh, doing it. Perhaps it exists. I, I'm skeptical. Yeah, okay. I mean, I guess since we don't know either way. I, 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 just for question, you know, it's all important. I think what will be true is that you cannot have uh, this type of P diverging in a Galilean invariant system. I think Galilean invariants will always. Uh, That's what uh, I mean. It's a homogeneous system. I use GR language. Yes, uh, uh, that is GR language for Galilean invariant. Well, Galilean invariance is a stronger condition than continuous translational symmetry because it also implies a boost symmetry, right? It means Galilean invariance, same thing. Just other words. So I definitely agree in a Galilean invariant system that you wouldn't have this. I think the I Galilean think invariant system does some uh, identity which uh, yeah, forces the type to be finite. So then it wouldn't be divergent. Oh yeah, you get the point. How do you question? So you just fun to think about it. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah. I should probably uh, move on. So. Um, so I, I I made this claim or this assertion that umklapp is always going to be irrelevant. Uh, and at the time, I didn't justify this assertion, so I, I, I want to come back to this point and, and try to explain why, why we think that that's the case. Um, and so more generally, it, the question that we're asking is what uh, emergent symmetries does a strange metal have? Because uh, what I wanted to claim is that a strange metal always has some emergent symmetry that would lead to this bottleneck, momentum bottleneck, or, or you know, if you, unless you have this divergent susceptibility. And it's actually not just momentum that can lead to a, this bottleneck, it's any conserved quantity, basically. So um, the question we need to ask is in what conserved quantities are there at low energies in the strange metal? So i.e., what are the emergent symmetries of the strange metal? So that's the question I will try to address now. So of course, microscopically, we know what the symmetry is. It's a you know, charge conservation symmetry and uh, uh, lattice translation symmetry, really. at least that's the assumption that we're making. Um, and then uh, the IR fixed point theory, which is the ultimate endpoint of the RG flow, uh, will also have some symmetry, but that symmetry could be much larger than the microscopic symmetry. That's, that's what we call emergent symmetry. Um, and there's an important here, point here. I, 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 will, I will define this symbol GIR to represent the uh, emergent symmetry of the IR theory. But I will only include internal symmetries in GIR. So uh, internal symmetries means points, symmetries that don't, don't move you around in, in space. Um, uh, so, for example, uh, a translation symmetry would not be an internal symmetry, a rotation symmetry would not be an internal symmetry. Uh, but then, so then I want to claim that uh, because the microscopic symmetries have to be, you know, manifested in the uh, in the low energy, uh, you know, there has to be a mapping from the microscopic symmetry group U1 times Z to the D, which is what I call GUV, uh, into GIR. So at this point, you could object because you would say, well, Z to the D is not an internal symmetry; it's a translation symmetry. So why should there be a map from this translation symmetry into an internal symmetry? And the reason is because uh, tran lattice translation symmetries from a microscopic point of view, they always act as an internal symmetry in the IR theory. And the reason for that is that there's some coarse graining uh, in space involved in this RG flow. Um, so if, even if you have, you know, if, if microscopically a translation will translate by one lattice unit cell, but uh, once you've gone through the coarse graining transformation in the IR fixed point theory, lattice unit cell is basically just zero. So, um, so the translation symmetry is actually becoming an internal symmetry in the IR. That, that, that's a very important point to make. So it means that uh, when we're talking about the uh, IR emergent symmetry, we're free to talk about only the internal symmetries and forget about everything else. Even though there may also be emergent spatial symmetries, but we don't consider those. Uh, so let me give you an example of that. Um, and this is a one-dimensional Fermi gas, or you can also switch on the interactions and it will become a 1D Fermi liquid. Um, so this thing has an emergent U1 times U1 symmetry. Uh, so, I mean, microscopically you have a single U1, which is the charge conservation, but 
it uh, turns out that it, uh, it low energies in the emergent theory, sorry, in the uh, IL theory, you have this emergent symmetry because the left and right moving charges are separately conserved. Sorry. Uh, the left and right moving charges are separately conserved. Uh, so by left moving and charge, I mean the total charge is kind of near the, this KL point uh, and right moving charges are charges near the KR point. So these are separately conserved quantities at low energies. And that's true in the Fermi gas. And also it's still actually still true if you have a Lattinger liquid. And so these are internal symmetries. And then we can express the lattice translation symmetry in terms of these internal symmetries. So the way that lattice translation acts on the IR theory uh, is, is it acts in the following way. Because the, the, I mean, because we're only considering the low energy excitations. The low energy excitations are kind of infinitesimally close either to KL or to KR. Um, so the, the total momentum is just uh, the amount of charge near KL, which is what I call NL, uh, and the amount of charge near NR, and, and you just have this formula. Uh, so NL and NR are the generators of U1 times U1. So this is expressing the lattice translation operator in terms of this emergent internal symmetry. So you see that indeed in this case, the lattice translation symmetry is becoming an internal symmetry uh, in the IR. And so now we, this is the question, what is the emergent symmetry group of the strange metal. Um, one thing you could imagine would be that the uh, emergent symmetry group DIR is just the same as the UV symmetry, which is U1 times Z to D. But there is a problem with that because the uh, Z to the D, I mean, that's uh, perfectly fine as a microscopic translation symmetry, but uh, uh, in the IR, as I mentioned, it has to become a, a internal symmetry. I think it's very uh, weird for a uh, any quantum field theory to have an internal symmetry that is a non-compact group. C to the D is a, a non-compact group. Um, it's very weird for a, effective, for a quantum field theory to have an internal symmetry that's a non-compact group. In fact, I do not know of any examples uh, where that occurs. And my conjecture is that this is just cannot ever occur, that non-compact internal symmetries are just not physical. Um, Okay, I say it as a conjecture because I can't prove it. I do have some arguments I can give. I won't get into that today. It gets a bit technical, but it seems like there's some bad stuff that happens if you had an uh, internal symmetry that was non-compact. Uh, and so given that, and given the fact that we don't know of any examples where it does happen, uh, I think it's a reasonable conjecture to make that non-compact symmetries are unphysical. Okay, so given this conjecture that rules out this scenario. There's another possibility, which is, uh, sorry, I have a typo here. Uh, the GUV is not U1. Uh, GUV is also always U1 times ZT. Uh, here, I just, you can cross out the GUV. Here. I just mean that the scenario I'm talking about is where GIR is U1. Uh, so that means that uh, you just have a, the charge conservation symmetry in the IR and the uh, microscopic translations just act trivially in the, in the IR theory. That's a scenario that I, you could imagine. And this actually does happen in, in semi-metals, for example. So in semi-metals, because all the low energy equitations live at the same point in momentum space, that's the reason why uh, translations, microscopic translations actually act trivially uh, on the IR theory, because the excitations are all in one point in momentum space. Um, so semi-metals do satisfy this property that the emergent symmetry group is just U1, but um, okay, we're not, we don't want to talk about semi-metals, we want to talk about uh, strange metals. Uh, and what I want to claim is that in fact, uh, this property of having just uh, U1 and microscopic translations act trivially is actually inconsistent with these two central dogmas that we stated, the clean lattice system and compressible. So semi-metals are not compressible. That's why they're allowed to uh, have this particular emergent symmetry structure. But uh, what I claim is that uh, that's actually inconsistent with compressibility. So strange metal would not do, do this. That wouldn't be what happens. May I ask a question? Uh, uh, yes. What would be the experimental consequence of this conjecture? Uh, which conjecture? The one about the non-compact internal symmetries? Uh, for, for example, would it be that the uh, coefficient of the linear T would not depend upon uh, whom claps? Yeah, I mean, this really conjecture is really sort of that implying that... that hmm? Sorry. Not really that the delta of omega term is absent, but that the coefficient of the linear in T term would also not depend upon in class. Is that is would that be one of the uh, one of the consequences? Yeah. So so this 
conjecture is kind of amounts to saying that umklap is irrelevant. So um, because, you know, for the reason I argued before, I, we expect that the linear T coefficient should be a property of the fixed point theory. So um, the fact that the fixed point theory cannot have just this discrete translation symmetry is, is, is what is telling you that, um, no, that this uh, coefficient doesn't come from umklap. I, I, yeah, I think that's what you're saying, right? I, I, I'm, I'm asking if it is a stronger statement than uh, what happens in Fermi liquids where the coefficient for T-square term is affected by umklaps. Here it would not be. Of a coefficient of a T-squared term? Yeah. Of a coefficient of a T-linear term? In a Fermi liquid in resistivity is affected by umklaps. Are you saying that it would not be affected by umklaps in a strain method? Sorry, are you talking about the coefficient of a t-squared term or the coefficient of a t-linear term for the strain method? No, I'm saying in, we know that the coefficient of t-squared term in a Fermi liquid is affected by umklaps. My yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that term precisely comes from umklaps, so yes. We agree. My yes. question is, is the consequence of your conjecture that the coefficient of the linear in T term in a strain method would not be affected by omega. Yes, yeah, that, 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 is, that is an implication of the conjecture, yeah. That, that, that would be very interesting to prove because experimentally it is so, in the sense that we know that the single particle scattering rate measured by photomission and the coefficient of the linear in T resistivity are the same to within a few percent or within the experimental uncertainty. So your conjecture is, is it has some experimental basis. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I expect of a scattering, I mean, yeah, the scattering probably also doesn't come from OCLAP. So then that would be consistent with that. I'm not sure exactly what the precise experimental test you're proposing is. Okay, we can discuss that later. Just clarification, John. That was exactly the point I wanted to make in the beginning when you interrupted. Exactly the point. I take a misunderstanding. Uh, okay, so okay, so let's continue. So uh, I, I mentioned two scenarios which I don't think can happen, or at least you know maybe there were some conjectures involved in that. Um, but so I have to tell you what I do think can happen. And so here it's useful to think about, I mentioned that these first two assumptions, clean and compressible, are also satisfied by Fermi liquid theory. Uh, so we should also, we should at least uh, work out what is happening in Fermi liquid theory first in terms of emergent symmetries, and then we can kind of generalize the strange metals. Um, and so for example, I already mentioned this example of a one-dimensional Fermi gas, uh, a U1 times U1 symmetry. Um, uh, you have emergent U1 times U1 symmetry. So it's not just a single U1, you have a two U1s, U1 times U1. That, that's the emergent symmetry structure for a 1D for me gas or a 1D Lovinger liquid. Um, uh, and secondly, for a two-dimensional Fermi liquid, you have even more emergent symmetry because actually the charge at every point of a Fermi surface is a separately uh, conserved quantity. Um, you know, whenever you set up a quasi particle everywhere on the Fermi surface, it doesn't scatter away. So uh, you literally have a, um, a conserved charge at each point on the Fermi surface, and that's a separate conserved quantity. So you have infinitely many conserved quantities in the 2D Fermi liquid. One conserved quantity for each point on the Fermi surface. Uh, maybe this is a technical point, but uh, it's kind of fun to think about what is the correct, precise mathematical definition of the emergent symmetry group. It's actually this thing called a loop group, uh, which I denote O U1, and it's a group of smooth functions from the circle into U1. So that is the precise emergent symmetry group of a 2D Fermi liquid. People have somehow like claimed that it's U1 to infinity, but that's not really correct. It, it's really this loop, loop group. Um, okay, so that's for uh, conventional metals, if you like. But uh, what happens for a strange metal? Well, you probably, it's just the same thing. I mean, uh, uh, there's no reason why a strange metal has to be different in terms of its emergent symmetry structure. So, um, and uh, further justification for that comes from the following theorems and in state. Uh, which is that if you have a system that's clean uh, and compressible, the theorem kind of guarantees that you have some very non-trivial emergent symmetry structure, such as the ones I just depicted on the previous slide. Uh, and in particular, what the theorem says is that if you have these two assumptions, clean and compressible, 
And if the spatial dimension is greater than or equal to two, then this emergent symmetry group GIR is not a compact finite dimensional Lie group. So that's a powerful theorem because uh, if you assume that this describes uh, the strange metal or, or any metallic system, then uh, you conclude that GIR is not a compact finite dimensional Lie group. So then what is it? It could be a non-compact finite dimensional Lie group, but that's the thing I sort of conjectured before is, is not physical. So the only other possibility is that uh, GIR is an infinite dimensional group. Uh, so that's you know certainly what happens in thermal liquid theory. That you have this uh, infinite dimensional emergent symmetry. Um, so what happens in a strange metal or generally in other non-thermal liquids? Um, it has to basically, for the reason I described, have some kind of infinite dimensional symmetry group. So you could try to think up very complicated infinite dimensional emergent symmetries, but I think the simplest case and probably the most plausible scenario is that the emergent symmetry is just the same as a thermal liquid. So I will introduce this idea of an ersatz thermal liquid which is a, a system that has the same emergent symmetry group as a Fermi liquid. So what that means is that even though there's no quasi particles, that you still have some conserved charge on each point of a Fermi surface. Well, firstly, it means that you still have a Fermi surface, um, which I think is sort of consistent with what people see experimenting in stage metals. They, they still have some kind of Fermi surface, although it's a different character. Um, yeah, so, yeah, and then secondly, you have a Fermi surface and then you have this conserved charge associated with each point of a Fermi surface. So that's what it means to have a, the same emergent symmetry group as a Fermi liquid, which is what we call an ersatz Fermi liquid. Now, you shouldn't, you shouldn't conclude from, from the terminology that an ersatz Fermi liquid is like almost the same as a Fermi liquid. Dy dynamically, it can be very different from a Fermi liquid, um, but we're just saying that it has the same emergent symmetry structure. Uh, so there's some interesting things about Fermi liquids that you can deduce from this emergent symmetry structure as we're describing in this paper. One of them is Lottinger's theorem. So the Lottinger's theorem, remember, is a statement about the relationship between the volume in the Fermi surface, volume enclosed by the Fermi surface and the microscopic filling. And so uh, we show in the paper that the Lottinger's theorem is actually can be interpreted just in terms of this emergent symmetry structure. So uh, as that's Fermi liquid, therefore, they Lottinger's theorem, like, like real Fermi liquids. So that's already a strong conclusion that we can make. Um, and then, okay, so we have this conjecture, which I, I have basically motivated already that strange metals are always as Fermi liquids, because they have to have at least some infinite dimensional groups. So probably it's just the same one as a Fermi liquid, it's this loop group. So now, okay, so that's the conjecture we have that strange metals are these as Fermi liquid. Um, then uh, you, uh, so we come back to this momentum bottleneck argument, which I was mentioning before which is how I came to this conclusion of a divergent susceptibility. So this bottleneck can occur not just from momentum conservation, it occurs for any conserved quantity. So in an ersatz Fermi liquid, you actually have infinitely many conserved quantities. So you will need to, to, to modify this argument a bit. You have to take into account all the infinitely many conserved quantities. Uh, this chi PP actually gets replaced by a, a, a matrix, an infinite dimensional matrix of susceptibilities to take into account the infinitely many conserved quantities. Uh, in any case, that's a pretty straightforward thing. And uh, the conclusion you get basically is not really any different from what you concluded just from momentum conservation. So even though you have these infinitely many conserved quantities, you get the same conclusion at the end, which is that the only way to suppress infinite easy conductivity in the fixed point theory uh, is to have divergent susceptibility of an operator with the same symmetry as this loop current order parameter. Okay, so then um, that comes back to uh, the um, to the story I, I was I was saying before, but because the strange metal must have quantum fluctuations of this uh, order parameter with the same symmetry as this loop current, um, then we've learned something about quantum criticality in the strange metal, and then we also have connection with this spontaneous entropy in the super gap. So that, that's all the same story that I, I, I said I gave you earlier on. Um, so uh, let's see. So I I wanted to say something more about uh, filling constraints on metals. I'm pretty much running out of time though. Uh, I will refer you to the uh, talk that I gave uh, earlier this year uh, on this subject. Uh, uh, and it's also available on, on YouTube. Um, okay, the, the basic idea is that uh, I made these assertions about uh, the consequences of filling. Like I claim that if you have compressibility that implies you can't have a compact Lie group. Uh, I claim that oh, that's Fermi liquid satisfy Lottinger's theorem. So all these claims are consequences of this general framework that we developed in this paper. And the general framework basically lets you compute the microscopic filling of a system, at least the fractional part, that's what new mod one means, um, just from the state of the emergent uh, symmetry uh, and the anomaly of the uh, IR effective field three. 
So this is, uh, if you like, the ultimate generalization of Ludinger's theorem, which is tells you Ludinger's theorem is a statement about Fermi liquid theory. This is a statement about any effective field theory whatsoever, however exotic it might be. You can com compute the microscopic theory just from this data of the, uh, of the uh, theory, specifically emergency and its anomaly. So I guess I don't really have time to explain what anomaly is. Uh, I have to skip over that. It's actually very closely related to symmetry protected topological phases in one high dimension. It's an interesting connection. Um, so symmetry protected topological phases are gapped phases protected by some symmetry. Uh, a famous example is topological insulators, which are protected by time reversal symmetry and charge conservation symmetry. So there's actually two hoofed anomalies which are relevant for filling out closely related to topological phases in one high dimension. Um, yes, yeah, so I have to skip over this for reasons of time, but it's all in this uh, previous talk I gave. You can look up on YouTube or, or, or look up the paper. Uh, so let me conclude. So this was our strategy that we have these experimental observations on strange metals. We condense them into a certain assumptions. Then we make general arguments and then we get constraints on theories of a strange metal. So you don't learn what the theory of a strange metal is, but you learn certain properties that any theory of a strange metal must have, at least if it satisfies these basic assumptions. And so uh, to summarize the constraints that we've learned, uh, we've learned that it has infinitely many emergence of quantities. We've learned that the emergence symmetry group has an anomaly. I didn't really cover that in this talk. Uh, we've learned that we have the divergence susceptibility if the operator has these symmetry properties, which is a connected to this current order picture. So that's what we've learned. And now uh, the question for us and for the community at large, we need to come up with some theory that satisfies these constraints. And uh, at least with having these constraints, it gives us some idea of where to, where to look for such a theory. But that's a question of the future to actually find a theory that satisfies these constraints. So, so I will conclude there. Okay, so very nice talk. So if anybody has any questions, um, you can either raise your hand or just ask. May, may I ask one? Um, so uh, given that you have uh, uh, the symmetry of uh, the order parameter in hand, uh, you must have tried to uh, close the loop and and derive from it the that the fluctuations in in that order parameter are are functions of omega with t or any other property have you have you tried that uh we haven't really thought about that i mean so the susceptibility is telling you something about the you know the static fluctuations or the you know, for example you know correlation functions in, in space uh, but in terms of the time to, and I guess, well, okay, I guess you can also do correlation functions in time, and they should also reflect this critical fluctuation. Okay, but we haven't thought much carefully about that. Well, how, how would you go about it? After all, you, you know what your order parameter is, you know its symmetry in the lattice. Shouldn't you go around trying to calculate the correlation function? I mean, we can't necessarily calculate. I mean, I want to emphasize that I haven't claimed that I have a theory of estrangement. That's, I've told you certain properties a theory of estrangement must have. I understand that. I'm saying, what are you doing beyond what you have told us? Yeah, I mean, I don't know in terms of these general constraint arguments, I'm not sure how much further you can push it. I think the future direction is to kind of come up with some theory of estrangement motivated by these constraints. So that will be the future direction, but we don't have that at the moment. Okay, because you know such things have been attempted and done before. I wondered if you had an alternate point. I mean, if you have a theory, you can try to compute these things. But uh, at the moment, I don't think we have a, a satisfactory theory that you could use to compute anything. But the fact that it has to satisfy these constraints at least is telling you where you might try to look for such a theory. Any other? Any other? Uh, yes, I have a question. Uh, uh, your your theory has uh, infinite infinite many conserved quantities, right? So, oh yes. Um, what what's the relation with the so-called uh, generalized hydrodynamics? Yeah, yes, that, that, that's an interesting point. Because you have these conserved quantities, you know, there will be some hydrodynamics because you know you get local thermalization. Uh, locally, you can only thermalize respect to the local values of the conserved quantities, and then the uh, you know, the, the spread of the longer time scales or longer length scales will be described by some generalized hydrodynamics. So that's a very interesting question, which I, I've been trying to think about a little bit. I mean, probably 
Um, yeah, so I mean, it will, it will be some generalization of this concept of zero sound in a Fermi liquid. So Fermi liquids have a zero sound mode, um, which you can think about as a hydrodynamic mode of these uh, conserved quantities, if you like, or it's not always expressed in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so more generally, in some non Fermi liquid, you also have hydrodynamics modes, and I think uh, in most cases they will basically be very similar to the uh, zero sound of a Fermi liquid because they they kind of parameterized by certain uh, uh, hydrodynamic functions, which are basically just the equivalent of these. Uh, um, lambda parameters of the Fermi liquid. Um, but I do think that there will be something interesting going on specifically in the case where this chi PP diverges because that chi PP diverging will mean that certain of the thermodynamic quantities will become singular. Uh, so then somehow the zero sound will work differently from a, the way it normally works. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have a, a more precise statement than that at the moment, but it will be very interesting to pursue. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? So actually, I think um, I had a question. So you mentioned before that um, you're basically modeling the strange ML as an Ozatz Fermi liquid, and every Ozatz Fermi liquid obeys Luttenger's theorem. So uh, now for the strange metal phase obeys Luttenger's theorem, right? Yeah, certainly if you believe this statement that oh, that's Fermi liquid, then it would have to obey Lambda's theorem, yeah. Is there any experimental evidence um, that every net strange metals will always obey Luttenger's theorem? Um, as far as I know, whenever people have been able to image Fermi surface, it always seems to obey Lambda's theorem. So, mm -hmm. uh, so experimentally, that seems to be uh, valid. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so if not, Denny, let's thank Dominic again. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, yeah, thank you for, for coming. Yeah, thank you.